I'm Edward Kingston. This is an adjustable approach to happiness. Uh, so first and foremost, I'd like to offer the question to you all. Uh, what is happiness? I'd like to give you a second to think on that. So we all have a definition in our heads now. Um, and it's a seemingly simple question to an emotion that we've all felt at some point in our lives. But I found that after hours of research, this question wasn't as simple as I first thought. Even the most conventional philosophers struggle to define it in a way that resonated with me in a powerful way. Often, their definitions were bogged with complex terminologies and ideas that I just couldn't understand. For instance, happiness is the joy that we feel when we're striving after our potential, not resenting the sex successes of others, and satiating our longing for satisfaction. John Dewey, a modern philosopher. I have no idea what this means. Even Socrates made a definition that I couldn't find useful, the capacity to enjoy less. And modern scientists just say that happiness is the release of dopamine in the brain. Helpful, real helpful. <laughs> so I asked my family and friends about happiness to find it. I got three responses that summed up the vast majority of answers. First of all, happiness is to be in the absence of issues and stresses. Or happiness is to have a clear mind and smile on your face or happiness is living a stress-free life surrounded by the belongings and people you love. These answers are all beautiful, and I like them all, and I feel like they resonate with each person that said them, but I couldn't stop here. I urged myself, and I urge you all, to find what is happiness to you, find what is happiness to me. More importantly, how do I achieve it? So I stand before you to share my story on how I answered these two keystone questions. I was born December 1st, 2003. I was a plump little baby. <laughs> I was mama's star. I had no issues or stresses. This would uh, all come to change. Early in life, I realized my fascination with the internet. I would love just sitting on the bed, staring blankly at the screen, and as my mom typed in letters, because I was too young to speak, let alone type, I would light my face up when I saw the piles and piles of answers that Google came back with. When I sat and thought back on what to give my TEDx speech about, I would realize that this was my first moment of true happiness. Moving on, Saul had to come to an end as I entered the most traumatizing time in my life, preschool. <laughs> I had to confine to certain issues and, and things and, and rules that I, I, I couldn't understand at the time. It was hard. I wasn't into it. So I found solace in one thing, the drive there. I would sit face pressed against the glass, looking out at the snow-capped trees, relishing in the beauty of Park City, where I grew up. One day on this drive, we woke up earlier than normal because we had more snow that day than we had expected. And as I sit face pressed against the glass, looking out, I saw the fields overfilled with just the most beautiful white powder, and I loved it. My mom driving, not so much, because even when you have snow tires and four-wheel drive, black ice can get the best of you. And as we merged onto the highway, taking our sweet time, being safe, the guy to the next of us didn't seem to have the same plan. And as he railed the side of our car, we went spinning to the left to a drop-off that surely would have killed us. And as we jolted into a stop, we whiplashed back and forth. Even after all this, still had to go to preschool in a fryer truck. It's pretty cool. This accident would have physical injuries and mental injuries on both me and my mother. My mother's being more spinal, uh, neck injuries, foot injuries, stuff like that. This would confine her to a bed for most of my childhood. For me, my issues were more mental. I procured something through this accident that I couldn't come to terms with for a while, my depression. Moving on, I had a pretty mundane life until fourth grade when things started to heat up at home. As I would go home every day, I would hear more and more screaming throughout my house home from my parents, my siblings. My siblings had to fulfill other obligations, so they're out of the house a lot. I had a little brother at the time, but he was too young to understand what I was going through. I was too young to understand what I was going through. My family was constantly in tears, and I had no idea where to go or what to do. And I realized, when thinking back to this, that this was my first memory of something that I didn't understand at the time, sadness. 
entering fifth grade, I got some more friends and I, I started to regain a school life that I understood, but at home things kept falling apart. My brother moving away to boarding school and soon after my sister, I had nowhere to go to at home. My mom still confined to a bed or yelling with my dad, I had nothing else to do. I felt sad and as I went to school the next year and switched schools, I lost all the friends I had had. And I started getting bullied every day more and more for being openly bisexual, something at the time I thought wouldn't make sense to bully me for. Why should someone care who I like? Why do I care who I like? It doesn't matter that much, but at the time, kids didn't think the same way. I was set into a cycle of sadness, one that I never seemed to escape. So I sat one night. I was in my bed at home, and I was lost. I felt like I was on a downhill, a spiral that I could... I, couldn't get out of for the life of me. I clenched my sheets as I listened to the screaming below me, and I was so done. I was done feeling alone. I was done being bullied every day. I was done waking up and going to bed the same sad person as I was the day before. I was done with it all. And so I looked for conclusions around me. I looked left, right, and forward, to find something, anything other than the answer that my mind was plagued with. But I hit the conclusion that it had to be all over. And as I reached to the side of me, to grab the razor next to me, I passed out. I would wake up alone, but this time different. I noticed that if I didn't do something, I was gonna end up dead. So I developed a system to find the thing that I craved, which would later be known as this foreign idea of, guess what, happiness. And here I am to share my system that I developed when faced with issues. It involves three steps. Assessing, acting, and adjusting. First and foremost, you have to assess the situation. You can, looping back to my story, we can see this when I came in terms with my depression. I had to see that night how bad it had gotten. I asked myself these questions. Did it harm me in a temporary or permanent way? How taxing was my mental illness? And would I be able to live through it? These questions and questions like these help me from over-exaggerating my problems and turning them to something that's way too big for me to overcome. Often in teenagers, especially me, I stress or dwell over situations that are far too little, little to exhaust a great deal of energy over. This sets me into a bad and vicious cycle. I like to think of it this way. If we spend all our effort trying to lift a feather, how are we going to manage the brick when we come across it? The next step is taking action. I come up with a unique plan for every situation I come across, but the key ingredient is just staying strong and composed. Even though you've already assessed the situation, kept in mind that it's not as bad as it may seem, you are still vulnerable to relapse into unhappiness. It's a very human thing. That's why we must actively combat our issues. If you find yourself in a place where you don't know where to go, you have to create a method to combat unhappiness. This can be playing sports, hanging out with friends and family, talking to people, reaching out for a helping hand. For me, it's taking a step back, breathing, taking my composure, not making a rash or harsh decision, and calming myself down. The beauty in this, though, is that everyone can make their own system. If this doesn't work for you, search for your answers, analyze your journey, and find your methods. Lastly, you have to adjust those methods. Adjusting will keep you above water always. I found that through my issues and stresses, I would get through and I would act, but I couldn't find a way to go afterward. I got plagued at the end. I felt that since I got through one issue, there would be none left. But the truth is that issues exist, have existed, and will continue to exist in all of our lives. And that won't change. So we have to look forward. We have to keep the composure and strength we had before, and we have to adjust it so we can, uh, we can expect the next, next upcoming upsetting situation. This will keep us above water no matter what issues are trying to plague us. So looping back to the beginning, I ask you these keystone questions. Now, through my journey, I found the answer for me. Warning, this won't resonate with everyone, just like those philosophers didn't resonate with me. 
This may not resonate with you. But for me, happiness is to feel human connections, feel alive, and more than anything, feel, the lo- feel and exude the love that keeps me going. And how do I achieve it? Assessing, acting, and adjusting. But I want to say that the beauty in all of this is that you don't need anything to do it. Because we're all human, because we're the most intelligent, most creative, most beautiful species on the planet, we already have the things inside us to do this. Back when I was younger, back when I was plagued with issues and stresses that I didn't understand, things that I didn't know existed, things that most kids don't know exist till they're way older, I used my humaneness, my curiosity, and my love for myself and others to get through it. And as I look into the audience, I see all of you with the same humaneness, the same curiosity, and the same love for others that I had. So go forth and find happiness for you. Thank you.